corn, okra, uh, turnip greens, collard greens, basically all of your Cracker Barrel favorites. Um, I'm the owner of Moore Farms and Insurance. We're an independent insurance agency where we offer um, farm and ranch insurance solutions to our producers here in Texas. And we just recently expanded to Colorado. We just hired a new employee who will be in Colorado. And so we're continuing to grow and just excited to bring some uh, a bird's eye view uh, of what we do and ways to also be a, a benefit and a resource to other producers across the nation. Thank you so much, Taryn, and, and thank you to everyone introducing yourselves in the chat. It's great to see people from different coasts and parts of the country. Um, I am going to begin just by giving you all a grounding to what we're here for today um, and what, our, what the agenda will look like. So I'm going to share my screen. And I apologize, it's having a little trouble loading, but it'll begin here in a moment. As I mentioned, this is a workshop as part of a series that um, our campaign, Generations for Water, is launching called Stewarding the Future of Water in Agriculture. There will be other workshops that will help to inform producers of the resources that exist to support on-farm conservation. And if you all aren't familiar, um, I will be introducing you know, young farmers. Maybe you all have some experience working with us um, I wanted to share a little about us to begin. I hand it over to Taryn to share his perspective as a producer and as an insurance agent, how insurance can benefit you. Then we will learn about non-insured crop disaster assistance program through FSA. Janae will be taking us through the application process, the benefits of the program. And Lane will be closing us out with a presentation on USDA micro farm and whole farm programs. And then we'll leave time at the end, 20 minutes. Um, and if we need more time afterward, you all are welcome to stay on if you have specific questions for the presenters. And then we'll wrap up, um, provide our contact information along the way. Uh, if you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat. And also, um, if it's, a, if it's a question that you need us to pause for, I'll make sure to monitor the chat and uh, help to slow things down. If there's something that you have a question about in the moment, I'm happy uh, to let a speaker know. And if your questions don't get answered right away, we will come back to them during our question and answer part of the agenda. And to share about the National Young Farmers Coalition, we are a grassroots network of over 200,000 farmers, ranchers, and supporters. This is a national network that is shifting power and changing policy to more equitably resource our next generation of working farmers. We do a lot of this work through our farm bill advocacy and our several policy campaigns. 
And we're working toward a just future where farming is free of racial violence, accessible to communities, oriented towards environmental well-being and concerned with health over profit. And we are able to do this work with the support and the efforts of hundreds, thousands of young and beginning farmers that are a part of our chapters across the country. We began as a chapter-based organization. Um, chapters existed before the National Young Farmers Coalition became an organization. And we have over 40 chapters in 30 states across the country. As a young farmer myself, I began as a member of my local chapter and I benefited from grants uh, that help young and beginning farmers, a $5,000 grant uh, that we give out to 100 farmers every year. And I was a recipient of one of those grants and our farm was able to install a well with those resources. So those are ways you know, that I came to knowing young farmers and participating um, as a member myself. And I was lucky enough to secure this position and have been on the staff uh, since May of last year. And I'm really excited to be helping lead our Generations for Water campaign. So you know a little more about our campaign. We, um, be, uh, the campaign began years ago and has developed uh, shifting from focusing on the Colorado River Basin to focusing on a national reach. Um, we host fellowships uh, to be able to develop water leaders, folks who can run for local boards, be in positions of power and decision-making, uh, to help lead the next generation of agricultural policy. And we do this through our fellowship program. We have fellowships. Um, we've had them in Colorado and in New Mexico. And soon we will be expanding this fellowship to a national level. We also host educational workshops for folks like yourself joining today. And we do this on an ongoing basis with our partners um, when there's relevant topics. Um, and if you have any requests of workshops that you'd like to see hosted, I encourage you, please reach out. We'd love to design a program to fit your needs. And a really big piece of the work that we do is farm bill advocacy. Um, we had been, been working on the farm bill um, for many years and take young farmers from across the country to the halls of Congress, both in DC and in local district offices to advocate for changes that we want to see to the Farm Bill. Also, we organize and mobilize our members to hold the USDA accountable to the changes that we want to see on an ongoing basis, whether that's showing up to hearings or uh, meeting with your local national natural resources conservation services offices. There's a lot of ways we do this work. I wanted to share a little about our farm bill agenda. These are really the, the, the big campaigns that we focus on. Um, and We work to improve access to land and capital for young and BIPOC farmers, support farm and mental health and well being, address costs of production and market access challenges. We know that small and diversified farmers often um, have less access, access to the programs available. And so we're really working to increase that access um, and understand that it intersects with many other things, whether that's affordable housing, student debt, um, 
we work at the intersection of a lot of issues on, and really central to the work we do in the water campaign is investing in climate action and water access. And in general, all of our campaigns are really geared toward improving USD access and accountability. I wanted to share specifically how we support young farmers facing disasters and crop loss. The first step, one of the things we're doing right here right now is providing useful in information on existing opportunities and as well looking toward the future of how can we improve the programs that exist to support young farmers and farm workers facing disasters. So these are some of um, many of the policies that we work on and are pushing actively with our congressional members um, and working toward the farm bill this year to improve access to crop insurance and disaster programs for operations that are diversified, organic, and selling locally. And really this means redefining and expanding what's currently available um, so that you all can benefit from farm safety net programs in the face of climate and natural disasters. And we know as things as the climate is heating up, it's important that we work to protect farmers and farm workers from hazardous working conditions due to climate change. Um, meaning that we should adopt federal standards to protect workers from harmful heat and conditions and heat stress. And like I said, the ways that we do this um, is by educating people through our workshop series. We will have a celebration after today on World Water Day. We also are working with farmers across the country to meet with their local NRCS leaders and congressional representatives and really working to uplift your story. So if there's something you'd like to share in the media as a blog, we host a blog as well as a podcast series and we'd love to feature your stories and experiences. Um, and as well, you have an opportunity to join a fellowship program um, and get paid a stipend to participate. If you'd like to learn more and stay in touch, I'm going to uh, paste the link in the chat. And I would love for you to reach out to me if you have any questions, if you're interested to learn more. I'll share my contact information as well. And here is the contact information. So it's in front of you, Aaron's email, as well as my own. And with that, I wanna bring Taryn back, back on. He is um, gonna provide really the importance of why we're here, um, how he as a producer and as an agent um understands the benefits of insurance and he can tell you a lot more than i can he's an expert in his own field so taryn awesome thank you anna for the introduction uh, i believe his fellow his fellow producers his fellow farmers and ranchers um you know it's important for us to be reminded that we're we're only the one or two percent of the entire population. So, for example, when I'm in when I'm in a room full of people who are also in business like myself, people who are educators, uh, doctors, lawyers, nurses, um, in a room of a hundred people, there's only like one or two farmers you know if we're looking at this thing worldwide so just be reminded that um, our role is uh, crucial uh, it's very important and so we continue to seek education uh, seek resources and how we can better um, feed our community and i'm not sure if anyone around here or on the zoom call is in my area or not but where i'm at I was at a uh, extension meeting last month and the number of people that are moving 
to my area, the DFW area, it's a crazy number. Like it was like uh, a thousand people every day or something like that. I can't tell you the exact number, but it was is a substantial number of people. And that's just on the outskirts of DFW. It's probably even higher in the actual, you know, um, Dallas town. So as people continue moving places, I mean, the population continues to increase. We have to seek resources and seek out ways to how we can feed our nation and feed our community. So um, I'll share with you guys the way that I got invo involved in agriculture on the front end, which some of you may know if we met at the uh, at the Colorado meetup. But um, I'm first generation. I joined an organization called FFA. I'm sure most of you know. And at the time, I had no kind of ag experience at all. I just um, I found a spark for agriculture because I saw my friends were building things. They knew how to fix things. And I saw I thought that was super cool how handy they were. And I did a garden in our backyard, um, which also reminds us that even on a small scale, even the smallest thing can eventually lead up to, to scaling your business and scaling up. So we had 10 by 10 garden where I was doing some peppers and watermelon and I brought some produce to one of our meetings. And I got to see my friends and my ag teacher and my parents eat food that I produced. And I was like, hey, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. People thought I was crazy. I'm still doing it and I have a business uh, from it now. So um, something as small as a something as small as a small garden in your backyard. Now we've scaled it up. We've farmed about 14 acres of uh, vegetables. Like I mentioned, sweet corn, okra, turnip greens, collard greens, etc. So uh, we continue scaling up. I'm hoping to uh, get some more wholesale markets this year and continue moving forward. But um, alongside that, I want to share with you guys kind of what I do every day to serve the farming population. Um, this is not a sales pitch. Um, I'm sure most of you, I couldn't even ensure because I'm only in Texas and Colorado. So I'm giving you true, unbiased um, education resources on uh, just a kind of bird's eye view of what we do. So we deal with lots of um, hobby farms in what I'm doing. And so people who are farming a hundred acres or less and sharing them, sharing with them ways that you can protect your farming operation um, is, is at an efficient cost. There's a lot of insurance companies out there. Um, I actually was at a Liberty, Liberty Mutual event earlier today. They had a lunch and learn and uh, they're a good partner of ours. Uh, in Texas, we have Germania Insurance, uh, Nationwide Insurance, and we serve, uh, like I said, lots of hobby farms. Of course, we have also lots of people who are farming 5,000 acres and up. We insure a lot of those as well. Um, but when I look at a farm uh, from an insurance standpoint up front, um, there's three main things that I'm looking at. For one, I'm looking at what's the production. That's the most simple thing, start from the ground up. What are they producing? So um, whether you're doing uh, cattle or if you're doing um, uh, soybeans, wheat, cotton, or if you're doing vegetables, I'm looking at that from an insurance standpoint of what's our what's our risk, um, what are things that we're facing up against. So, for example, with me doing vegetables, honestly, my only risk is my crops um, dying. Oh, by the way, liability. So, we think about also if I spray my crops, um, if I I have a ramp up resistant. Um, corn variety and I'm spraying Roundup and it drifts over to my neighbor's field and they lose their crop uh, that's not Roundup ready, Roundup resistant. Um, they're going to come to the guy next door. Hey, did you by chance spray Roundup uh, yesterday? My crops, I just lost um, $50,000. Did, did Just wondering by chance with that you. So um, from that standpoint, as an insurance agent, we have to look at chemical drift liability. So um, no matter what you're doing, there's also there's always some kind of liability that you're going to face against whether you're doing crops, um, cattle, um, et cetera. And so on the chemical drift portion, um, I haven't had many claims, honestly, with that. So I know it's something that can happen, but we haven't had a whole lot of chemical drift claims or just things that I look at from an insurance standpoint. Um, I know they're going to discuss crop insurance and stuff later, but on the property side, 
chemical drift is something you should look at if you do have an operation and you're doing any kind of spraying. Uh, me personally, I'm not an organic farmer. We do spray, we do use herbicides, pesticides, insecticides on our operation. So we do have to carry chemical drift li uh, liability insurance, as well as if you're if you're selling to a market, uh, if you're selling to a, a wholesaler. So I, I just made a deal with the wholesaler here in town who owns a barbecue restaurant, a Baker's Ribs restaurant, and we're also trying to get into Soul Man's restaurants uh, for our okra. They're going to require you to have general liability insurance for at least a million dollars um, and also products and completed comp products and completed operations. So if I uh, were to sell someone okra and then they, for some reason, come up sick, they're going to backdate and say, oh, well, uh, this farmer sold okra to our store and the person is sick. They try to see my um, see me if I have an LLC. So um General liability insurance for a million dollars. And here's the thing also, these aren't all set policy. These are all under under one thing. So your general liability, your chemical drift liability can all be under one umbrella. Your property coverage, uh, your tractors, your planters, uh, your cultivators, everything can be under one blanket. So big things to look up, look up for is for one, uh, what's our risk? What are we growing? If you have livestock, you gotta look at uh, animal collision. If your cows get out or horses get out, you got to look at the liability portion for that too. If a car hits it and your horse dies, um, of course, the person hit the car, who hit the uh, livestock is going to be upset and sue you. But also you lost money because one of your, um, you know, you had some cattle or, or livestock die. So there's different risks for different operations. But from a big standpoint, property, um, property liability, and then, of course, crop insurance uh, if you're if you're doing large scale, larger scale production. So, just things to be aware of. Uh, best thing is to partner up with a, a farm insurance specialist when it comes to farm insurance because there's lots of carriers out there um, that may have farm in their name, but they don't understand true farm insurance. And so, find someone in your community or that you're in your town or even it's in your state that uh, truly does farm insurance. And what we do is we look at your operation and we put together a plan that's going to protect you, protect your pocketbook, and also do it at the most efficient cost as possible. And I guess I'm also open to questions if we have any questions uh, before the next presenter. I'm not sure what the format is for that, but happy to answer questions if needed. And I'll also be glad to give my contact information, my phone number and email, if anyone has any questions outside of this. And you, you all can use the raise hand function if you do have questions or post questions in the chat. Any questions we don't get to now, we will come back to during our question and answer. Great. Easy peasy. <laughs> um, next, I wanted to bring on Janae to take us through some programs through the Farm Service Agency. Yeah, thank you for having us on today. I, again, work for USDA on the Farm Service Agency side of things. Um, so farming in, by nature is risky business. No matter how prepared you are or how well thought out of a plan you have, we can't control mother nature. Risk management is a very important part of survival of your business and knowledge is also a key to your success. So today we'd like to introduce to you some of the FSA programs that we have more specifically NAP or the Non-Insured Crop Disaster Program as a tool or option for you and your operation. Lane will be adding some additional tools that RMA has to offer um, in just a few minutes. A majority of our programs start with an acreage report, and that's kind of where I wanted to start with you guys today on getting started with disaster assistance. In order to participate, you need to become a producer of record with FSA. And so the first place that you need to start is to find your local FSA office. 
The link provided here is going to take you to a map where you can click on the state and then your county and it'll bring up contact information for your local FSA office. You want to contact your local FSA office and register for a farm number. And in order to do that and get added to a farm, you're going to need to either have a copy of a recorded deed or lease. The reason being is when you certify to a crop, you're certifying that you have risk and control in that commodity. I really encourage you guys to build a relationship with your local county office. Many times there's programs specific to you that you may be eligible for, but you don't know about. Uh, if you have that relationship, they'll be able to help you based on your specific operation and your location. So what is NAP? NAP is the non-insured crop disaster program. It's designed to reduce your financial losses that occur when a natural disaster strikes, causing a loss of production and value. I encourage you to go to this link that I've provided here uh, and look at the fact sheets for NAP. They're found in the USDA newsroom. The fact sheets are great. They hit all of the major rules without overcomplicating the program. Um, I've also linked the Federal Register information if you decide you want to research that. Uh, that is where all of our rules come from. Today we're going to hit a broad overview of the life cycle of NAP and what to expect if you decide to participate. I think it's important um, just to have the big picture of where you, the things that you're going to be required to do. So the NAP life cycle starts with obtaining a policy on eligible crops you intend to grow and follows the crops all the way through harvest. If an eligible related disaster event happens, then we add a few steps like reporting the event by filing a notice of loss and requesting an application for payment. Do None of us like, yes. We cannot see if you're sharing your screen, we cannot see the slides, so. Oh my gosh, we, we tested this too. We I apologize. Following. We are following you, but we cannot yeah, see the. There we go. I am so glad you said that. We even tested this and. OK, so um, I think when we if if Anna doesn't post it in the um, the chat, I will post it at the end. So this is the slide I was looking at when we talked about the um, the the link to your local county office. And then um, this is the web page for the FSA fact sheets here. And I'll post these in the chat on, or Anna may have already done that. I apologize about that. Okay, and this is the life cycle. This is where I was saying, this is the basic life cycle that, that we're gonna cover today. And it basically follows um, the crops. So as we look at the life cycle, none of us really wanna think about something bad happening to our crops. So um, it's important to know what tools we have and the knowledge to know how to mitigate some of those risks and whether it's right for you. Is it, is it cost efficient? Okay, so let's start at the beginning. What coverage is available through NAP? NAP is only available on commodities for which your CAT level coverage through RMA or federal crop insurance are not, is not available. Um, this excludes pilot programs. So if you can go downtown and get an RMA policy on it or an insurance policy on it, we can't offer NAP coverage for it. There's really two types of policies that we have with FSA under NAP that you can obtain. The first one is basic coverage, and it's pretty equivalent to the RMA CAT level coverage with a 50% yield coverage and a 55% price coverage. This means that you suffer the first 50% loss and FSA will pay the remaining expected loss at 55% of the expected value. Or you have buy-up. A producer can cover a commodity with buy-up at 100% of the price, and you can increase your yield coverage from 50 to 65% in increments of 5%. So a crop with 65% yield coverage would kick in after the producer suffered the first 35% expected prediction loss. Then FSA would cover the remaining 65% of the expected production at 100% of the expected price. Now you can't get buy-up on crops with the intended use of grazing. With buy-up, you can also choose the direct market price option. Uh, one of the requirements though with buy-up is that 
for BIOP to attach, you have to have a history of successfully growing the crop in that county for at least one year. So you may be asked to provide a different additional information if you elect this BIOP coverage. So by now everybody's wondering how much does this cost and is it worth it for me? The basic coverage is $325 a crop with a maximum of $825 per producer per administrative county. If you're involved in more than one county, the maximum amount out of pocket is gonna be $1,950 and that's for all interest in the US. However, if you qualify as an underserved producer, the basic coverage is gonna be free. So we're gonna go over who qualifies as a underserved producer on the next slide. If you elect buy up and you choose a higher level of coverage, then there's also gonna be an additional premium. A producer's responsible for that premium is gonna be 5.25% of the guarantee. However, again, if you qualify as an underserved producer, you're gonna get a 50% reduction in your premium. So who qualifies as an underserved producer? And there's four different sections a producer could qualify under. A producer may qualify under more than one. If that's the case, please check all that apply. In order to get free and reduced coverage, a producer must file the form CCC 860. It's a self-certification to one of the following items. Part A is socially disadvantaged, which includes race and gender. And a producer would need to only certify this one time, and that certify, certification is going to carry over year from year. You could qualify under limited resource. A producer must meet both a gross and adjusted gross income level. These levels are state and county specific, and they're adjusted for inflation each year. Because this status is met based on income from the preceding two calendar years, this status must be certified to yearly. So you would have to file that 860 every year if you're qualifying under this section. This tool um, at the limited resource, the lrftool.se.egov.usda.gov tool. And again, I'll post that. Um, we'll get, get you the link in the chat so you can have it. Um, it's it's gonna help give you the exact amounts that you're signing off on based on your state and county. The beginning farmer or rancher to qualify for that, you must not have materially and substantially participated in the operation for more than 10 years. You'll only be required to report the month and year you started participating and that certification is gonna be effective for 10 years from that date where you began. There is also a veteran farmer or rancher certification where you must have not materially or substantially participated in the operation for more than 10 years, or you recently obtained a veteran status during the most recent 10 year period. You again will certify the month and year and it'll be effective from 10 years from that date. You won't have to file that every year. If you meet any of the above criteria and file the CCC 860, you'll be eligible for free basic coverage and the reduced buy-up coverage. I just want to mention, um, if you do participate in any of the other FSA programs, we have uh, different policies written in and advantages for qualifying for this. So even if you don't participate in NAP and you want to participate in one of the other programs, I would encourage you to file this if you qualify. All right, so we've already start, started. For a crop to be eligible, it must not be able, available through RMA or federal crop insurance at the cat level coverage, but you must also be in the business to commercially produce the agricultural commodity in order to qualify. A few examples are listed here. The most common in my area are crops grown for food and livestock consumption. This is a great example of why it's important to build that relationship with your local FSA offices. What is eligible in one county may not be eligible in another county, but your local county office will be able to tell you if NAP is available for a crop or a commodity. Yields. You're going to hear the words yields or APH, which is actual production history used. These terms are typically used interchangeably, uh, so don't, don't get overwhelmed with all the new terminology. We talked about the level of coverage earlier. 
This approved yield is what determines your individual level of coverage. In order to provide a sound, consistent method to determine what a producer's individual expected production should be, they've come up with many, many rules to determine an approved yield. Uh, a producer is going to certify to the production history on a form CCC 452, which is called NAP Actual Production History and Approved Yield Record. And when you do that, you need to pay close attention to this approved yield, as that's what's going to dictate your coverage level. And if you have buy up, what amount your additional premium is going to be. There's too many rules to really go into how the APHs are established right now. However, I do want to point out that there are exceptions built in for new and beginning producers. So if you don't have that history, we've got policy that tells us how to handle it and make sure that everybody's is handled the same. You will want to turn in your production timely every year, regardless if there's a disaster event, because it will be used for your approved yield. A commodity report. It's also called an acreage report. This is required to participate in most all FSA programs. The acreage report is the driving factor of everything. So you as a producer will be required to timely file an acreage report with the crop, the type, the intended use, your irrigation practice for each crop. You'll also have to report your risk and ownership share for that crop. Let me explain that a little more there. If you own the crop, you're going to have 100% interest. If you do a crop share with somebody else, so say you are farming another individual's ground and you're doing the work, they're providing the land, you may crop share 50-50 or with different percentages. Your share of the risk is what would determine that percentage. Again, the acreage reporting dates are state and crop specific. You're going to want to contact your local FSA office to determine when you should report each crop. So the one thing I want to point out with NAP is the NAP rule says crops should be certified 15 days prior to the beginning of harvest, even if that's before your state's acreage reporting date for the crop. You may have to visit the county office multiple times. If you have fall seeded crops and you're also harvesting spring seeded crops or growing them, you may have to go in um, multiple times depending on that acreage reporting date. All of the information you provide on your acreage report will affect your NAP coverage, including your payment and premium if you elect buy up. Again, it's the driving factor for all of the, almost all of our FSA programs. You're also gonna get a summary of coverage letter. This happens quarterly, and it's gonna remind you of your coverage, give you an estimate of your guarantee, based on your acreage certified and approved yield. And if applicable, it'll give you an estimated payment due. It won't be a bill, but it'll give you the ability to, uh, to know those numbers. With the notice of loss, it's your responsibility as a producer to notify FSA if there was an eligible disaster event. To qualify for assistance, the loss must be result as a result of an eligible cause of loss during the coverage period. Not all causes of loss are eligible for call, all commodities, but you must report this loss to FSA using the form CCC 576. One of the things I see most common is producers not timely filing their notice of loss. This notice of loss needs to be filed within 15 calendar days of the earlier of the natural disaster occurrence, final plant date, if you're claiming prevent plant, the date the damage of the crop becomes apparent or the normal harvest date. You could be filing multiple notice of losses in a year and should report each disaster occurrence. So an example of this would be uh, if you have drought and excessive wind happen on June 5th, then you get hit with hail on August 10th, you would need to report both those loss events separately. For those fruit and vegetable producers, there's additional requirements for you to notify FSA within 72 hours of the date of damage or when the loss becomes apparent. These crops are rapidly deteriorating and a field inspection or adjuster may need to inspect those fields quickly. The next steps in application for payment. This is part that everybody really focuses on and everything else that we've talked about has led us up to this. We want to make sure we're timely filing an application for payment as well. 
the application for payment must be filed on that form CCC 576 in the county office where you obtained coverage and you certified your commodity. You must file your application for payment within 60 days of the last day of coverage or har harvest. In order to file an application for payment, you will be required to turn in your production evidence and or an appraisal if applicable. So how are we gonna calculate that payment? Don't get overwhelmed by all the numbers on the, on the screen or the formula. It's just pulling in everything we discussed into a mathematical formula. First, we're gonna determine what your guarantee or disaster level is by taking the acres you certified, your share of the crop with the risk, your approved yield, and your coverage level. We're gonna multiply all of those, then we're gonna subtract the production you raised, the production will also include harvested and appraised production, which you left unharvested in the field, but could have been harvested or marketed. Basically, it's accounting for all harvestable production, regardless of whether you harvested it or not. This will give us your production eligible for payment. We're then going to take the approved price times the price coverage that you selected. For basic, that's going to be 55%. And for buy-up, it's going to be 100% times a payment factor. Now, we didn't really go over payment factors. Essentially, if you harvest the commodity, it's going to be 100%. If you made a management decision not to harvest the crop, your payment will be reduced based on expenses not incurred. This factor is set at the state level and could be different for different crops. Again, FSA office is going to be a great tool. We're also going to subtract a salvage value. The salvage value is referring to a value received from a commodity that could not be marketed as intended. An example of this would be potatoes normally marketed for human consumption could not be sold as usual, but the potatoes were sold at a lesser value as hog feed. That value would then be subtracted. The remaining amount, that's your calculated net payment. So NAP premium billing, for those producers who elected and qualified for the buy-up coverage, you're going to be billed between January 1st and the 15th of the subsequent program year. Your premium is due within 30 calendar days, and it's going to be due regardless of whether the crop suffered an eligible disaster event or not. If you fail to pay this NAP premium, it's going to make you ineligible for assistance under NAP for any subsequent year until that debt is paid. You can still take out a policy, you just won't be able to earn um, a subsequent year's payment until that debt's paid. So that was a lot of information, and I know your head's probably spinning. I know um, it's a high-level overview, and there's tons of details that go with it, but let's review the overall general process fairly quickly. NAP is a risk management tool to reduce your financial losses due to eligible natural disasters. NAP is only available on crops that cat level coverage is not available through RMA or federal crop insurance. You need to become a producer of record with FSA, obtain coverage, report your acreage, timely file a notice of loss if applicable, churn in your production, and timely file an application for payment if applicable. For those of you choosing buy-up, you're also gonna have to pay the premium due. So before I close out and hand it over to Lane, I do wanna mention that FSA does have other additional disaster programs that you could be eligible for. Note, this is not an all-inclusive list of disaster programs, much less other FSA programs. Uh, emergency Conservation Program and the Emergency Forest Restoration Program can help producers restore their land after a disaster event. The LFP and LIP are livestock programs available to livestock producers. TAP is available to orchardists and nursery growers, helping to replant or rehabilitate eligible trees, bushes, and vines. And ELAP consists of multiple mini programs to help provide assistance producers who may not have been eligible under other FSA programs. We do have two programs going on right now I'd like to mention. These are revenue-based programs, and this is kind of a new concept to FSA. 
Um, they're based on disaster events incurring in prior years. So um, you had to have been farming during these years in order to qualify. ERP is an emergency relief program and it covers crop losses due to eligible disaster events that occurred during calendar year 2020 and 2021, while PARP provides assistance to producers with revenue losses in 2020 due to COVID. The deadline for both of these programs is June 2nd of 2023. So if you were in business in 2020 and or 2021, but didn't report your acreage, you're still gonna be eligible for these programs. Just make sure and contact that local FSA office for further information on it. Um, with, again, I just I can't stress enough how important it is if you're going to participate in some of these programs to communicate with your local FSA office. Get your name in that hat, let them know what crops you're raising, and report your crop acreage. They're going to be the best resource for FSA programs available to you and based on your interest. And that is what I have. Um, I apologize for my script slides not showing at the very beginning. Do we have any questions? Yes, Janae, there's a question from Emily in the chat. Okay. It um, says, what type, I can read it out loud. What types of, or unless Emily, if you'd like to come off mute, I'm happy to read it or you can ask directly. Happy to read it. So the question in the chat, Janae, is what types of farm is NAP typically a good fit for? It seems like it would be best suited for large scale operations with a limited number of specialty crops. So is there a better option for highly diverse small scale operations? So if you qualify, and, and I agree with the, the first statement, um, if you're not an underserved producer. So if you are a small operation and you don't fit with any one of those um, criteria on the underserved producers, it's going to be more expensive. But if you qualify as an underserved producer, that big basic coverage is free. And I would really recommend that you take it out. Talking about specialty crops, most of your specialty crops are very high value. And so even though you're smaller acreage, you may still be getting into a lot of dollars. And when you look at the dollars and the protection you're gonna get, it may be worth um, paying that 325 per crop for just your basic coverage. Again, that's, that's where knowledge is key, knowing what your benefits are going to be and knowing what your cost is going to be and whether it fits for you. Um, but that limited resource piece, I think, fits a lot of the smaller producers that are, are farming some of your smaller acreage. Thank you so much. Is Thank are you. there yeah, are there any other questions? Um if Janae, you could also post that contact information in the chat. Yes, absolutely. Folks are are um able to raise their hand or if you've got a question, you can put it in the chat. Again, if um Janae is not able to answer at this moment, we will come back to questions. Well, it looks like you did a great job uh, presenting the information. Doesn't look like there are questions immediately. Um, so wanna pass it to Lane who will be sharing some of the other programs. Thanks, Anna, I appreciate it. <clears throat> Again, uh, if you missed before, uh, when I introduced myself, my name is Lane Webb. I'm with the Risk Management Agency. And today I'm going to give a very short overview of crop insurance. Uh, I'm gonna define beginning farmer, rancher, and veteran farmer and rancher for you. Uh, ours is a little bit different than the FSA definition. I want to go over our new program called TOGA. We call it, it's the Transitional Organic Grower Assistance Program. And then, of course, the big presentation is the whole farm revenue protection and micro farm policies. 
So a little about a little bit about the federal crop insurance program. Uh, some of the basics here. It uh, protects agricultural production from naturally occurring events, and approximately 70% of all losses paid out due, uh, from crop insurance are due to too much or too little water, basically flood or drought. Uh, RMA, the um, Risk Management Agency, does serve as the regulator and the reinsurer for the federal crop insurance program. Uh, we do have some, uh, we do have private insurance uh, providers. I, I, the private market actually sells and services uh, these insurance contracts. Uh, and federal crop insurance is a large part of the farm safety net. Uh, we went from two th uh, $30 billion in liability in, in the year 2000 to over $200 billion in liability today. <clears throat> Significant increase. Uh, this chart here just kind of shows all the players, if you will, involved, all the parties involved with the federal crop insurance program. As you can see right at the top there is RMA or the Federal Crop Insurance Corporation, and we work through the Federal Crop Insurance Act to develop regulations and policies and procedures. Uh, our reinsurance agreement is with uh, right around 14 approved insurance providers today. Uh, they are the ones that through their agents, uh, there's approximately 8,000 nationwide. Uh, they sell the insurance policies to, as you can see, over uh, probably 1.2 million dollars. Uh, to over, um, excuse me. They sell insurance policies to agricultural producers, and right now it's currently right around the 1.2 million uh, policies is what we have. They also manage the loss for loss adjusters that work the claims. There's around 5,000 of those nationwide. Uh, that pay the losses to those uh, producers. Next few slides just kind of go through the responsibilities of each of those parties within that chart there. Uh, RMA, of course, being at the top of that list there, uh, we developed the policy terms, the rates, and the prices. Uh, we collect data on crops, uh, insurance policies, and such. Uh, we also provide auditing and oversight of the finances and the market behavior uh, within the crop insurance program. Again, like I said before, uh, RMA is the primary reinsurer for these insurance policies. RMA compensates the insurance companies, and that's with the uh, administrative and operating expenses, and then, of course, underwriting gains and losses. And we also work with our stakeholders, private submitters, and such to develop new products and offer program expansion uh, when needed. Responsibilities of the insurance companies falls to sales. That's where they manage their agents and issue uh, insurance policies, crop insurance policies. They also work uh, claims uh, for losses uh, on those insurance policies. They manage their own adjusters, and of course they pay those claims out if, if one is determined. Uh, they also offer their own quality control that makes sure they uh, comply with the rules uh, set forth uh, by RMA uh, within the policies and procedures and the standard reinsurance agreement. And sometimes they assume risk of those crop insurance policies. And this offers them an incentive structure to safeguard program integrity. Puts a little, it gives them a little bit of skin in the game, uh, per se. Now the crop insurance agent, they're the, really the face of the program for, for, most, of, for most of this uh, crop insurance program. Uh, they're the ones that sell the policies and they educate producers as much as they can about these policies. And they often write for many companies. Uh, so, um, so they may not just be tied to one insurance company, they may be writing for several of them. And of course, it comes down to the most important part of this whole program, and that's you, the producer. Uh, the producer's responsibilities in, in this program is to buy the policies uh, if they see fit. They provide their production history. Uh, they provide their planted, and uh, they plant and report acreage planted. Uh, they pay their premiums. They provide notice of loss uh, in, um, in light of an event. And of course, they receive loss payments if one is determined uh, necessary for, for, for claims. So what does crop insurance look like today? Uh, we offer coverage of, uh, uh, for over 604 varieties of crops. That's almost double 
of that that was covered in the year 2001. Uh, we offer products that cover production losses due to natural causes. Some of those natural causes include drought, flood, hail, insects, et cetera. Uh, there's also a revenue coverage piece of that, uh, and that would cover a drop in revenue or maybe a decline in market price. And 72% of our policies earning premium in 2022 uh, were actually revenue protection program or policies and revenue protection with the harvest price exclusion uh, option there. Our programs offer individual coverage, but we also have some programs that offer area and index based uh, uh, loss of payments as well. Some of the market share information that you can see here on this slide, our principal field crops uh, are about, they take up about 87% of our planted acres that are insured under the program. You can see the list of crops there. Uh, for example, barley, corn, cotton, grain sorghum, uh, and there's several other there that are included in that in that list. Uh, fruits and nuts are about 65% of the, the market share within crop insurance. Vegetables are 81%. And then you've got the third largest crop based on acres insured, uh, that of pasture, rangeland, forage, and hay, and that holds the 33% uh, market share there. And like I said, even though it's relatively low, it is the third largest crop insured based on acres. I'm going to briefly touch on a new program that come uh, that, uh, that happened in the 2023 uh, crop year or reinsurance year. That program is called the Transitional and Organic Growers Assistance Program. And what this program does, it provides producer support through crop insurance premium assistance. So for the 2023 reinsurance year, which includes sales closing dates from July 1st of 2022 through June 30th of 2023, if you are a transitional or organic grower, uh, what this program offers is 10% uh, discount on premium subs or actually at 10% more subsidy uh, uh, for all crops that are in transition. Uh, for those that are certified organic grain and feed crops, you get a $5 per acre premium benefit there. And for the whole farm policies, and, and, and of course, micro farm falls under that, you get an extra 10 points uh, of, of premium subsidy or 10% of premium subsidy for, uh, for any transition or organic crop uh, grown on your whole farm or on your farm operation. Mm -hmm. the, the good thing about this program is there's no action needed by the producer if, if you, if you uh, claim or if you certify to be a transitional organic grower, this, uh, these benefits are automatic. Out of the interest of time, I'm only going to go over the definitions of beginning farmer rancher and veteran farmer rancher. Uh, uh, there are several benefits that come along with this. Uh, I think Anna is going to actually post the uh, link to our national fact sheets in the chat, so you'll be able to, to look at any kind of fact sheet we have out there. Beginning farmer and veteran farmer rancher is one of those, so you can go out there and look at that. I believe there's another one for the TOGA program as well that she's going to post out there, so you can kind of see uh, the list of crops that would be eligible for, for that program. So for RMA purposes, for crop insurance purposes, this is outside of the FSA definition, a beginning farmer rancher is an individual who has not actively operated and managed a farm or ranch in any county, any state with an insurable interest in a crop or livestock as an owner operator, landlord, tenant, or sharecropper for more than five years, five crop years. Uh, the 2018 Farm Bill actually added an exception to that, and it made it 10 years for the purposes of whole farm. And that way, uh, these uh, producers can benefit or receive the full benefit uh, of, of being a, BF, a beginning farmer rancher. Mm -hmm. Now, veteran farmer rancher um, is also defined, and that's an individual who has served on active duty in any one of the six or all six of the military branches. And this includes the reserve components of those branches of military, uh, discharged or released under the conditions other than dishonorable and has not operated a farm or ranch or has not operated a farm or ranch for not more than five years or is a veteran 
again, who has obtained that status within those five years. And there's some exceptions that go along with that. Uh, again, out of the interest of time, I'm not going to go too much into that, but you can uh, you can read through those on the fact sheet as well. <clears throat> So I'm going to get into my presentation now, uh, and that's the whole farm revenue protection and the micro farm uh, policy program. Um, <clears throat> and I'm going to go over these two programs. Um, I understand that some or maybe most of y'all are probably more interested in the micro farm program. My PowerPoint's just built on on around all of it. So I talk about both of them kind of side by side. Uh, with some exceptions uh, within each of these slides. So as I go through that, you'll kind of you'll kind of hear that I'll say whole farm versus micro farm or both. <clears throat> so what is micro farm and whole farm? Well, it's a it's a program that offers coverage for diversified farmers. Uh, whole farm revenue protection was first implemented for the 2015 crop year. And that's a program designed to provide coverage for all crops under one crop insurance policy, uh, marketed or, or targeted to diversified producers, including those that grow specialty and organic crops. Microfarm is a result of the 2018 Farm Bill, uh, and, it, and it was first offered uh, in, the 20, in 2022 as a streamlined approach to whole farm, uh, specifically for small producers. And as you can see, there's a there's a comparison here. So for, for whole farm revenue protection, uh, that will offer coverage up to $17 million in revenue. Um, uh, that revenue or that insured revenue can't include any post-production costs uh, or, or value-added costs. The expected values for your commodities are primarily based on third-party sources and your yields are, are based on underlying policies and or your or the producer's four-year average. With Whole Farm, you are eligible or hey, you have the ability to purchase additional individual crop insurance policies. Uh, and those are that are authorized under the Act, uh, the Federal Crop Insurance Program. They must be at the buy-up coverage level. And the thing to keep in mind though, is it becomes first insurance, meaning that any indemnity or loss payment made by these policies will count as revenue earned under the whole farm revenue protection program. Now for microfarm, like I mentioned, is a streamlined approach to whole farm specifically for small producers. Uh, and, and the comparison here is it, it it's meant to, um, it's meant to have less paperwork requirements uh, it does insure farms uh, with approved revenue up to $350,000 for the initial year, and of course, a $400,000 for each and every year after that. <clears throat> Post-production and value-added costs are uh, or may be included in your approved revenue, <clears throat> which is a big difference on, uh, than the whole farm program. The expected values are based on the insureds, the producer's past three-year average of total revenue and total acres. So we just basically use your history to, to come up with your expectation maybe for the current year. However, under a microfarm policy, no individual crop policies are allowed under that policy. Uh, the big exception here for both of these programs, and this is a question we typically get uh, with every presentation, is whole farm and microfarm does work with NAP. So you can have a NAP policy the FSA program that Jana just, uh, Janae just went over and a whole farm and or micro farm policy. So those two do work together. So what does whole farm and micro farm cover? Well, it's, they're both programs are, are, are designed to recover all revenue or revenue from all commodities produced on your farm. Uh, that includes hemp, uh, it includes animal and animal products. It includes commodities purchased for resale. There's a limitation on that, and that's 50% of your total expected revenue. Uh, it does have a, a few exceptions, though, or exclusions, if you will, and that's timber, forest, forest products, or animals for show, uh, show sport or pets. Um, Whole farm revenue protection does offer replant costs uh, with approval by your insurance company. And typically those are gonna be on your annual type crops. Uh, and those are identified in our actuarial documents uh, on our website. Uh, replant costs are uh, 
replant payments are not available under the microfarm policy. So microfarm, like I said before, is a streamlined, more accessible version of whole farm. It's a result of a feasibility study to the uh, ensuring uh, local foods uh, study that was uh, contracted by RMA and their recommendations was to basically change the whole farm program to allow um, to basically make accommodations for local foods producers. So we decided to go one further than that based on that recommendation. And instead of defining what a local foods producer is, uh, we just made it revenue based limits and we created the whole or the micro farm program. So, so that's why it come about. It was a result of the 2018 farm bill. Uh, we were to consider that and, and that's what we did. And like I said, it is a, it's, it's designed to ensure farm operations with an approved revenue up to $350,000 for that first year of insurance. And if you're carryover insured, uh, then uh, that, that jumps up to 400,000 for those carryover policies. Again, the important piece here is post-production and value-added costs may be included in your improved revenue. The examples we give here, if you are a producer that sells uh, through a farmer's market and you offer jams, jellies, or pies made of fruit that is produced on your farm operation, then you wouldn't have to exclude the cost to make those products. So the jars, the, you know, the, the processing of, or, or the pie tins and things like that, you can keep all that stuff in your revenue um, uh, uh, for coverage there. And like I said before, the expected value is based on your or the producer's past three-year average of total revenue in acres. And I'll go over that calculation a little bit uh, more here in a little while. <clears throat> so how is the amount of insurance determined under the whole farm and micro farm policy? Well, it's basically a lower of determination uh, and that the insured revenue would be the lower of your current year's expected revenue, your farm plan, basically, what is your expectation for the year at the selected coverage level or the adjusted historic revenue uh, at the selected coverage level. So it's a comparison of history versus future, if you will, and we would, the insurance would be based on the lower of those two numbers. Basically, what we're trying to say here is we will never, insurance will never be offered for anything more than what you've historically produced is what we're trying to say. There are some uh, adjustments that can be made to the historic revenue, and we're gonna go over those here in a little bit in a few slides. So some of the options that you have, we uh, whole farm and micro farm is, uh, is, it offers flexible coverage levels basically tailored to the need of the producer. Uh, and what I mean by that, it offers coverage levels from the 50 to the 85% coverage levels, and those are offered in 5% increments. Um, now, under the whole farm uh, revenue program, uh, the, a diversification of three commodities, a commodity count of three, would be required in order to qualify for that 80 and 85% coverage level. I'll go over that commodity count here in a slide or two. Uh, uh, for micro farm, it's automatic. Uh, anyone uh, eligible for the micro farm policy is automatically qualified for the 80 and 85% coverage level. Uh, unfortunately, whole farm nor micro farm uh, offers a catastrophic level uh, of coverage. Post-production and value added cost. Uh, as I said, I think this is gonna be the third time I've said it, but under the micro farm policy, Post-production value added and market readiness operations may be included in your expected prices and your allowable revenue. Under whole farm though, uh, post-production and value added costs must be removed from that, those prices and, and, and revenue. However, market readiness operations may be left in that approved revenue. Uh, and just to kind of understand what market readiness operations are, uh, we've defined it uh, as the minimum required to remove the commodity from the field and make it market ready. And it must be on farm, in field, or in close proximity to the field. And that could be, a basic example is a, a lettuce grower that cuts their lettuce, bags it, washes it, everything they do is all in like kind of 
kind of one movement, I guess, if you will, moving through the field, uh, all that can be included. That's considered market readiness for, for that purpose. <clears throat> the bag, the washing of, and, and, and things like that. So what causes a loss payment under whole farm and micro farm? Well, it's a natural cause of uh, natural causes of loss and decline in market price during the insurance period. Um, in order to be paid, uh, uh, a loss payment or a one to be determined, taxes must be filed for the policy year before any claim can be made. And of course, when your revenue to count under the whole farm policy or micro farm policy is lower than the insured revenue, a loss payment would be made. And of course, your revenue is determined based on your tax records, uh, which is why we require them to be filed uh, before we can make that determination. So does diversification matter for whole farm and micro farm? I remember I went over that just a while ago. Uh, so there are some uh, determinations that are made based on the diverse diversification of the farm operation. Um, it determines under the whole farm program the eligibility of the 80 and 85 percent coverage level uh, and like I said whole farm requires three for that to happen and what we talk about here is a commodity count uh, it's not just simply how many commodities are you producing it is uh it's important to understand that um it is a measure of the farm diversification that shows the farm has reduced risk by producing significant amounts of multiple commodities. And that means how much of how what's the percentage of revenue each commodity um, um, provides for your total revenue. And the example that we give here, you have two commodities on your farm. One commodity produces 90% of the revenue, another one produces 10% of the revenue. Under that scenario, you would only qualify for one commodity count. However, if you took those same two commodities, one produced 80% of your revenue and the other 20%, based on the commodity count calculation within the policy, then you would be eligible for two commodities. And that calculation it goes down further and further. You can actually diversify into seven different commodities based on our calculation. <clears throat> now for microfarm, of course, the 80 and 85% coverage levels are automatic. Uh, and that's because we've automatic, we have set an automatic diversification of three uh, for that policy. Um, now, under the Whole Farm Revenue Protection Program, there are some other requirements, diversification requirements. If you're a potato farmer, you must have a total, or you must have a commodity count of, excuse me, a commodity count of two in order to be eligible for Whole Farm. And if there's another uh, FCIC or RMA policy out there that offers revenue coverage on one of your commodities, uh, you must have a, a, a count of two as well. And that's under the Whole Farm Program. So diversification for programs, uh, for these two programs also uh, determine the amount of uh, discount to a premium rate. So we offer under the whole farm program, we offer a discount uh, to your premium for commodity counts from two to seven. So two, three, four, five, six, and seven would get a reduction in premium rate. Uh, Microfarm is set at three. Uh, so that's a maximum that you could get for microfarm. Uh, for whole farm, it could be up to the seven commodities. That's the maximum. Um, also, uh, the diversification will determine what your premium subsidy would be uh, for your farm. Now, <clears throat> anyone with two or more commodities uh, would, would qualify for the whole farm premium subsidy amount. Uh, and that's an 80% subsidy, uh, which means the government would pay 80% of your subsidy and you would be responsible for 20. Now that's automatic for microfarm because like I said before, we're set at, we set that diversification at three. And I'm gonna show you a chart here on the next page. It kind of shows what that looks like. Um, so if you have a commodity count of one under the whole farm program, you can see the subsidy is the maximum you can get is 67. It goes down the higher the coverage levels. Uh, and then looking at the whole farm subsidy, so you have two. 
if you have a commodity counter two or higher, you can see there's an 80% subsidy rate across all coverage levels there, with the exception of the 80 and 85%, where that 80% subsidy level will 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 be lesser uh, as it goes higher there. Now, when we talk about these subsidies, we talk about beginning farmer, veteran farmers or ranchers, add another 10%, that's a benefit there. And also if you're an organic producer, add another 10%. So as a whole farm or micro farm policy holder, you could qualify for a 100% subsidy. You would get a bill for a dollar, but you could qualify based on those two programs alone for a 100% subsidy of your premium, uh, just, just by definition. Just something to think about there. So this slide here is uh, is specific to whole farm revenue protection. Uh, this is some of the limits for qualification. Like I said before, it covers up to $17 million of revenue. Um, now, if you have animal and animal products um, on your farm, the coverage is limited to $2 million for those commodities. And also, there's a $2 million limit on your greenhouse and or nursery commodities. Now, both of these, commodity, both of these uh, limitations exclude any aquaculture commodities. So we did that for, I believe it was 22. We remove aquaculture commodities from, from those limitations. Um, and like I said, the greenhouse nursery commodities are, are, are similar to those that are insurable also under our nursery policy, but it doesn't include um, items such as produce grown in hoop houses. And our example there is someone that grows tomatoes in a hoop house for the purpose of selling the tomatoes, the fruit from the, the tomato plant uh, as a commodity, that's not considered a nursery or a greenhouse commodity. However, if there's someone growing tomato plants to be sold as plants, that would be considered uh, a nursery item and would fall under that limitation. This is where I just offer kind of a recap of everything that we've been going over so far. So um, again, the benefit to whole farm and micro farm, it provides coverage for a wide variety of crops. This includes uh, crops that may not have individual coverage uh, under one crop insurance policy. We cover all of it under one policy. I'm going to quickly roll through these um, as much as I can. Whole farm, again, covers up to $17 million of revenue. No post-production costs are allowed in that revenue. Expected values are based primarily on third-party sources. Expected yields are based on underlying crop insurance policies or the insured's four-year average for those not covered by another policy. And you may purchase another individual crop policy under the whole farm program at a buy-up coverage level. Under microfarm, there are less paperwork requirements under the microfarm program. Uh, it ensures farm operations with an approved revenue up to $350,000 for that first year. However, uh, I mean, sorry, post-production and value-added costs may be included in your approved revenue. You're automatically eligible for the 80 and 85% coverage levels. Expected values are primarily based on your history, the three-year history of revenue and acres, uh, and no individual crop policies are allowed under that policy. That is something we are looking for, uh, looking to in the future. Uh, we are, uh, we're kind of uh, analyzing that. We've got a lot of issue, uh, a lot of, a lot of feedback on on that, and we may look at adding that later on. But we're we're, we're still looking at that. <clears throat> So I talked earlier about uh, historic revenue adjustments. So there are some, some, some historical revenue adjustments that can be made. Uh, and, and, and this kind of bring, helps bring that historic revenue up to a, to a level that may be closer to what your, your expectations are for the current year. So the first one is, uh, well, the first one's considered farm expansion, of course. There's one that's built into the policy, and that's an automatic historic revenue adjustment, we call it indexing, but what that does, it, it, it's a calculation that accounts for farm growth um, over the last few years. And basically, if one of the last two years in your history is greater than your average, then the 
indexing calculation kicks in and it could bump that historic number up. So that's what I'm saying. It accounts for that automatic farm growth that's already that's that's been happening over time. The other way you can expand, of course, is with expansion, and that is typically physical expansion. And what that does is it offers allowances for up to 35% of growth over the historic average. Uh, and that's, of course, with insurance company approval. So <clears throat> for expanding operations due solely to organic production, uh, we've increased that limit. It's the higher of 35% or 500,000. Uh, so we made that change a couple of years ago for the organic producers. But basically what we're talking about here is mainly physical expansion. You've added acres. You've transitioned to organic. You have um, added facilities, if you will, and that's production capacity and, and things. So that's what we're looking at there when we're talking about expanding operations. Now, three or four years ago, we added options to account for bad years. Uh, so we understand that producers have bad years and historically that will drive your historic average numbers down. So we've added um, we've added options to account for those years. And these are very similar to what our other crop insurance programs already have in, in that we, and I'm just gonna name them here. The first one being re revenue substitution. So basically if any year within your history is less than 60% of your average, your historic average, we would substitute that year for 60% of your average. I know that's a mouthful, uh, but it, it can help. Um, so basically we would limit any year to 60% of your average in your history, if elected. The other one is revenue exclusion, meaning you can just literally just drop your lower year. So out of the out of your historical numbers, you can drop the lowest year and re-average based on the number of years left. So typically there's a five-year history, drop your lowest number in there, and you create a four-year history average, and that, and that can also raise your historic number up. And the last one is the 90% cup on your approved revenue. Basically what we're saying there, we would limit your 90%, your historic revenue to 90% of last year's approved revenue. And what that means is that you'd have to be a carryover insured to be uh, eligible for that one, but, but it does help a little bit. <clears throat> so I'm talking about all this history and all this other stuff, and you're asking, what do I need to even apply or what kind of information is required to, to get these policies? <clears throat> well, that's what this slide's gonna kind of go over. <laughs> For whole farm revenue protection, uh, there is a requirement of five years of farm tax history. So basically what we're looking for is five years of records, uh, not including a lag year. So the year immediately prior to the insured year is a lag year. So, so for example, for 2023, this year, what you would be required to present to, uh, to your agent would be tax forms for the 2017 through the 2021 crop years or uh, tax years, those tax forms, Schedule Fs. And if you don't have a Schedule F, but you have farm revenue, um, any kind of paperwork that can justify the, the farm revenue so we could create a substitute Schedule F. Now that's for calendar and fiscal year filers or early fiscal year filers. We do have another um, uh, fiscal year filer out there. It's called the late. Anybody that is um, that's filing their taxes for a tax year that starts in September 1st or later. Um, it's a whole nother historical period. We basically just back it up a year. It goes from 2016 to 2020. Um, and your agent and your crop insurance agent can kind of explain that. Of course, the sales closing date for those guys that's gone and, and passed since since November already, but but it's out there. So there are some exceptions to this number of years required. And that kind of goes back to the beginning farmer rancher definition, right? So if you are, if you qualify for a veteran as a veteran or beginning farmer rancher, uh, you may qualify with fewer years of records. And it's, I think it's three or four years. I can't quite remember right now, but I think it's three or four years that you would need uh, of historical um, tax forms in order to, to, app to, to apply. Now we do make exceptions, other exceptions for this, and, and that's qualifying persons not required to file a U.S. tax return. Our example here is tribal entities 
uh, although they may earn some farm revenue, they, they may not be required to file taxes. So a tax return wouldn't, they wouldn't have one, but we, but we do based on some requirements, uh, they, they can meet in order to, uh, to be uh, eligible. And some of these producers that are uh, physically unable to farm for one year. So sometime in your five year history, you just couldn't farm, you were unable to, you got sick uh, or anything like that, then, then we do make an exception for, for, for that year. Now for microfarm, again, like I said, less, less paperwork required to, to make your initial application. Uh, we require at least three years of farm tax forms when we're talking about microfarm. So minimum is three years. So you can get into the program with three years of tax forms. In our example there for 2023, you would need 2020, 21, and 22 tax years in order to be eligible for the microfarm policy. <clears throat> So what other kind of information would be required? Uh, information about what will be produced on the farm during your insurance period. Now for a whole farm, uh, that's a commodity level report that we're looking at. So you would need specific information for each and every one of your commodities. Now for micro farm um, or direct market commodities, we're looking for total revenue and acreage for the last three years. Uh, that way we can determine your expectation. Uh, and again, the, this information is used to complete your intended farm operation report or your farm plan, if you will. Um, other information as applicable, and that could include supporting records if requested, your organic certification, any kind of inventory for any commodities or production that you're carrying from carrying over from from the year prior, or accounts receivable information. And some of this stuff is. Is not required up front, uh, but but should be available if if your agent or your company is asking for it. If you're not familiar with whole farm revenue protection, or you are familiar with whole farm revenue protection, big change for this year, 2023, we eliminated the expense reporting. Um, now we're not saying that you can mark all that stuff out on your Schedule F and things like that, because if you are a whole farm producer, uh, we do use expenses to determine what your post production numbers would be, so we can adjust that out of your approved revenue. Um, so that was just a big change, and that was that was used as part of the 2018 Farm Bill to reduce the paperwork burden on, on producers and, and agents. <clears throat> So I know my time's coming up short here, but I, I'm gonna, I'm almost done, I think. Uh, what is the timeline for whole farm and micro farm? Well, sales begin generally by September 1st. Uh, the last day to purchase, the last day to purchase crop insurance or for whole farm is your sales closing date. And this is county specific, region specific. Uh, for late physical year filers, I went over this in all counties across the nation, uh, it's November 20th. Uh, and then you have your county specific and what we call the spring dates, the normal spring dates. It could be uh, January 31st, uh, February 28th, or March 15th. I know there's a few of you based on the introductions that I saw, we've already surpassed your uh, your sales closing date. So maybe a little bit too late this year already, but this is something to keep in mind for next year. Uh, most of the nation is March 15th. The California, Arizona, middle of Texas down through Florida kind of is the 228 area. And then of course the Southern Texas is 131. So you kind of just have to um, get with your crop insurance agent to figure out what that date may look like for your, your county. And, and of course, you're, by yourself, that's when you're, you're typically, you're gonna file your intended farm operation report and, and your tax forms are due and all this other stuff, all that stuff that I was talking about, about com and your commodity information and things like that. Now your revised farm operation report is due July 15th. That's for everybody. That's basically stating, that is like Janae mentioned, your acreage report, if you will, uh, what you did already for the year, what you still intend to do for the year, so we can provide and we can kind of come up with your with your coverage. August 15th is the billing date. That's uh, when your bill comes out for all insureds. Uh, and then you have a final farm operation report, which we call sort of like your production report that's completed. That must That is due either at the time uh, loss determinations are made, or by next policy year sales closing date. Uh, and if it's not done by the time, uh, uh, by the required date, then of course we would limit your coverage to 65% to the following year. <clears throat> 
just real quick, a few more slides. So other facts to understand about whole farm and micro farm. Again, it covers revenue produced within your insurance period. So if a commodity is not harvested or sold uh, all, and, and considered produced, it still counts as revenue. If a commodity grown last year and is sold this year, that's not considered a covered commodity because it was produced last year outside of the insurance period. And then of course, for commodities that grow each and every year, like cattle, only the growth for the insurance year counts. And our example here is if you come into the year with a calf worth $800 at the beginning of the year with the intention of selling it for 2000, we're only gonna insure the $1,200 of growth. That's the insurance uh, available for that calf. Uh, and then, of course, inventories and accounts receivables, like I said before, that's some of the information that may be required. Inventories and accounts receivable are used to determine what that produced amount would look like. I talked about expected prices under the whole farm and micro farm program. Uh, we, uh, like I said, we for direct marketed commodities under the whole farm program and the commodities on the micro farm program, they are determined the exact same way. They're determined using the past three years average of allowable revenue and the past three years uh, acreage for all commodities produced on the farm operation. And basically it's just a math problem. It's, it's re revenue over acres determines your price per acre. And just kind of keeping in mind that post-production and value-added revenue may be included in allowable revenue and expected prices under the microfarm program. That's very important. That is, that, that's new for, for the microfarm program. Uh, it, it's typically not allowed. It's not allowed under whole farm, but for microfarm, that was one of our key aspects to the program. Uh, other facts to understand about whole farm, prices and yields. And again, this is a commodity level program uh, uh, for whole farm. Prices and yields used to determine these, uh, to value the commodities to be grown must meet the expected value and yields guidelines within the policy and procedures. The values must be what the producer can reasonably expect to receive in the local area for the commodity. They're based to the extent possible on third party sources. However, if there's a marketing contract out there, uh, we do use that at the time they become effective within the policy limitations. Uh, yields must be what the producers can reasonably expect to produce under normal growing conditions. For commodities covered under another FCIC plan of insurance, the approved yield for the underlying policy will be the yield for whole farm, uh, with very few exceptions there. Now for commodities that offer no other coverage, we're basically going to we're going to result revert back to the insured's four-year average yield, uh, and and if if the producer has no history of that crop, then we can use replacement yields when allowed by policy to determine what that average would look like. So how do you buy whole farm or micro farm insurance? And this is for any RMA or FCIC crop insurance program. Go through a crop insurance agent. They can answer a lot of the questions you may have about specifics. Uh, but we have a tool on our website, uh, right here it is, um, that's the agent locator tool. Also on our website, there's cost estimators, there's links to your local regional offices. Um, all the other programs that are out there are on the RMA website. This is the actual link to the agent locator so you can find your local agent uh, in your area. And these are the whole farm team contacts, me up top right there it's direct my direct email my counterpart is griffin schnitzler he wasn't able to make it today but his email is there and then if you would just want to contact the entire team we have an email there for general questions we ask that you contact your agent and your in or and or your insurance company first but if you have just a a question that just needs to be answered we'll do our best to answer the question and that's my presentation i was only six minutes over on i'm sorry No, no problem, Lane. You had a, a lot to cover, and I hope it was useful information for folks. We will be sending out these slides as well as the recording after the meeting. Um, and like I said, if you are interested to hear more from our water campaign and have access to future workshops, I will post again our link to sign up for those action alerts in our newsletter. Um, otherwise, I'm going to ask for Lane and everyone else who is either a region in one of the regional offices in USDA 
um, or works for the national staff, if they're willing and able to put their contact information in the chat. And now is the time that we're gonna open it up for questions. We know that there's been a lot of information um, about the, the application process and who qualifies um, and what crops qualify for these different programs. Um, you are welcome to come off mute, to unmute yourself, to ask the question. If it feels more comfortable, to you, you're welcome to put your question in the chat. Um, as well, you can raise your hand. Um, so yeah, now is the time if there's a specific person you have a question for, you can direct it at a speaker or in general ask the question. And I see a question from Aaron um, to Taryn. What questions should producers ask their insurance agent when they go into their office for the first time, especially a beginning farmer? And Taryn, I don't know if you can see that question in the chat or have any recommendations. Not sure if Taryn could hear us or if others could could um, answer this question. I don't know if Janae, if you have any suggestions for producers um, who are seeking help from an insurance agent. I mean, I'll speak on this. I, I can't really speak very smartly on it because I don't really know what the answer to that question would be because I, I think it's not so much what kind of questions you should be asking, rather just be prepared to answer questions about your farm operation and about you as an individual, I guess, um, uh, a farmer, uh, not, not necessarily you personally, but as a farmer, right? I, I think, I think, more so on your end would be be prepared to answer questions the crop insurance agent may have they'll be able to determine maybe what's the best policy for you uh the best combination of policies for you uh they'll be able to work on quotes for prices for you and things like that based on the information you can provide about your your operation uh i don't know um unless you're having a pre-call with them prior to the meeting, what kind of paperwork do I need to bring in, right? Um, uh, things like that, but uh, uh, that's that's my advice. I, again, I, I don't, I'm not on that end of the, of, of the process, but uh, that's, that's what I would say is just be prepared to answer questions. Are there others who have specific questions about, you know, this could be specific to your own operation or generally when applying? I would. I would be interested in uh, sort of posing a hypothetical scenario and, and seeing how the, specifically the micro farm policy comes into play. So for something like, I mean, we mentioned flood and drought. So, you know, say there's a one acre market garden and um, it gets flooded and, um, you know, it, there's a there's a certain percentage loss, so I know I assume the policy would cover that. But is it is it basically like 
is the policy covering the loss in revenue for the entire year and the entire operation? Or is it covering the loss associated with that specific uh, commodity and the amount of area that was planted? So Emily, that is a great question. And, um, and the best way to explain it is if that's just a small portion of your operation, and I say small, let's just say if that's just a portion of your operation, then you want to file a notice, right, with your insurance company or your agent to say, hey, I took a loss on this chunk and this is what's affected, right? That way the verification of the event happened. But if it's a portion of your operation, then what Whole Farm and or Micro Farm does is it looks at the operation as a whole. So, and I'm just gonna use an example, right? You have a $100,000 farm. This one acre market garden is worth say $10,000, right? So as you know, you can only get 85% coverage so you're looking at 85%, I mean, so that loss on that one acre would only be 10% of your deduct or $10,000, $10, which is only 10% of your insured or your, it's only a small portion of your deductible, if that makes sense. So you would, you would still be at, you'd still have $5,000 more to lose before a payment could be made. I'm trying to explain that. I think I explained that right, but I think that's the example. $100,000 farm, you have $85,000 worth of coverage, you lost 10,000, well, you still made, what, 90,000, so really you didn't take a loss yet, if that makes sense. Yes, For I, crop insurance I think, purposes. I think that makes sense. Now, if that was your entire operation, then yeah, you would be paid based on your coverage level and verification that the loss occurred and all this other stuff, right? There's a lot of things that go into that, but you know, if that $10,000 was your operation, you know, you take a, an 85% policy of $8,500 in coverage and you lost all of it, then yeah, you could possibly be paid out that 8,500 based on, you know, other determinations being made. Does that make sense? Yeah. It does make sense. I guess, you know, one of the things that the, the complexity that I have a hard time understanding is like, if that happens in the spring, and then the farmers rally to basically replant and everything, and go through all of that effort, and it ends up sort of being a wash, then I guess it, it's like, as, it's as if it had never occurred, because we're looking at the entire Correct. You're, you're, yeah, you're, you're looking at a, and for, for the simple purposes, January 1st through December 31st is your insurance period. If you're a calendar, your filer, right? So we're looking at that entire year. What would your taxes look like, right? That's what we're looking at. What is your revenue from your tax forms look like? And that's what we're basing everything off of. Great. That is so helpful. Thank you. And I see a, a question in the chat um, from Tamisha. I've heard in a few spaces, farmers have been having trouble applying for the whole farm revenue program due to the paperwork lifts. And I know that you mentioned this, Lane. Um, does anyone have advice for how to manage this for the first time applicants? Um, I, I, I do. My advice is get with your crop insurance uh, uh, agent as early as possible. Uh, that doesn't prevent the paperwork from having to happen, right? Because this is not new. This is something we've heard over and over and over again. And we are working diligently um, and over the years to try to reduce that, right? Uh, the, the, the what you need to bring into your agent's office um, in order to apply for, for these policies. Now, um, that being said, although they're not required to be up front, a, an insurance company can still ask for them at any time. And I'm talking about supporting records, uh, yield records, price records, and things like that. You may still be asked for them. So my advice is as early as you possibly can get with your crop insurance agent. Uh, if you live, say, the perfect example is today, right? Uh, I mean, we are, it's, no, it's February 23rd, you got five days before the, the final sales closing date, say in, 
in Central Texas, across you know Louisiana, Mississippi, um, Alabama, Georgia, and Florida, right? The sales closing date is two twenty eight. So it's probably I won't say it's too late, but I mean you're on the verge of being too late at this point, right? Uh, you should have been in your agent's office probably on January 1st or maybe even December 1st or whenever that may have been. I would say get with your agent as early as you possibly can, uh, and then you guys can kind of work through that. What kind of paperwork do I need to bring to you in order to apply? Uh, knowing that you got to have tax records, Schedule Fs, uh, knowing that you may have to have, to have some information about your farm uh, and things like that. So that's the best advice that I can give you. I can't eliminate the paperwork lift. We're easing it as much as we can. I would just say get with your agent, talk with them as soon as you possibly can to make that determination. And hopefully it's not, it's all still going to be a lift. It's just you have a little bit of time to gather the information before you have to have it in. Hopefully that helps, Tamisha. That's, that's a, thank you for that answer. And, um, I think part of that paperwork piece is, you know, not everyone speaks English. You know, this is directed, this question is directed at, at anyone who can answer. And Janae, maybe you have a different perspective from FSA. I know that one of the biggest steps in establishing your farm is having a farm number. Um, are there resources, you know, for people who speak languages other than English, whether that's Swahili, Dari, pasto, there's um, some examples in the chat. Is interpretations, are they available um, for paperwork? Um, are there agents who speak other languages? Go ahead, Janae. Oh, um, I was just going to say we have uh, some forms in multiple languages, and I know that you can request interpreters when you get to county offices. I am not sure on specifically what languages that's available for and if they fit those that you mentioned. Um, I guess the... <laughs> I guess the canned answer here, the standard answer is we are an equal opportunity, right, uh, uh, agency. So I would hope that agents would have, especially they know their area, right? They know what their market is and stuff like that. You would hope, I would hope that they would have at least a number they could call for that translation service, right, for that interpretation service. Uh, I don't know for sure. I don't know if I would assume that they're required to, but I don't, I don't want to say that out loud. Uh, but I'm assuming that there's some way possible that they can get an interpreter, an interpreter there uh, to help out. Now, I would say that there's probably not a lot of our RMA forms that are um, not in English and or Spanish. You know, I think it would just depend on who's creating the forms because RMA, we only say what needs to be on the form. We don't dictate what language it needs to be in or 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 how they present that form it just there's required information that that has to be there and and based on that i mean an agency and a company an insurance company uh in certain markets could create those forms in different languages but i am unaware so i'm not going to say that yes there are but i would assume if if they know their market enough then they're working to to make that happen i hope And I think that that's um, feedback to continue to provide to local offices. Um, you know, if you are in an area and you're you're helping people to navigate these programs that are having experiencing barriers, um, like language barriers, I think you know, Ellie, if if that's something you're able to help people do is to provide that feedback to the local offices. I think that, you know, making the request um, and showing that there is a need will help them, you know, to at least work toward filling those gaps. Um, you know, and that's part of the work that we do with young farmers is, is identifying, you know, what are the gaps in these programs and how do we ask for that in the next farm bill? You know, is that asking for more funding to USDA 
uh, local offices so that there are interpretation services um, so that these programs can reach those who need it. Um, you know, and if you all have any feedback, this is a time also to, to share, especially we have folks from different regional offices, USDA regional offices on the call. If you have specific regional questions or concerns, um, you are welcome. You know, it is time. Uh, we will stay on for a few more minutes just to make sure that everyone here has an opportunity to have their questions answered. Um, and if the speakers uh, have any last words to share as well, um, this is a time for that. And I understand too, uh, appreciate all of those who've joined um, for this session. If you have any questions, again, I'm gonna put my contact information in the chat. Please feel free to reach out at any time. This is both my email and my cell phone number. And um, you as well, in a follow-up email, we'll have the contact information for our speakers, um, as well as access to the slides. Anna, this is uh, Jeff. I'm one of the regional directors for RMA. I, I will say that there are some uh, forms we have translated into the requested languages. Uh, Spanish is obviously the one most asked for, and we did we do translate some forms into it that are RMA related forms, not uh, forms that the AIPs, pro uh, the insurance providers provide to their uh, clients. But for RMA forms, fact sheets, things like that, we have provided some uh, translations. Uh, I think maybe fact sheets have been the most popular one we we have translated. And um, it, it just comes as a, if, if there's a request for it, uh, a need for that, uh, you know, I'm not sure even how we determine need. I, I believe we've been trying to process as many as we can. So if, if there's a fact sheet or one of our informational pieces that needs to be uh, translated, we, we can just by request. And hopefully we, we can get it done. And Jeff, how do they request that? Is there a specific location on the website? No, uh, uh, probably the best way for them to do that is to uh, reach out to the regional office. I put in the chat box that you could go to the USDA RMA website and there's a, a tab that says RMA local and you can click on to whichever state you're in and you'll have a link to the general email box for the office. It may not be the director's bo direct box, but it does get to the proper people within the office. And they can make the request uh, through that by by that method too. And I see Ellie's comments that um, it is a big barrier to people reaching out. Um, I assume, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, that maybe the barrier in reaching out is that they don't speak the language. Um, so if somebody reaches out in a different language, is there an opportunity for that to be translated? Or what how how is um how do you all respond, you know, to to contact that's received in a different language from Spanish or English? Uh, Spanish actually for my office is very easy. I have a staff uh, that I have four uh, fluent Spanish speakers in my office. Um, you know, also if the office that they're contacting, for example, I'm going to use Spanish as an example, they contact one of our other offices that can't translate, we'd be happy to, you know, help put that translation to the uh, the proper office. Uh, a lot of times it comes to the point of trying to identify which language do they want to get, trans. you know, do they need help with. Um, for example, there's many dialects in, in uh, Chinese that I'm not sure I would be able to be able to figure out what dialect um, needs to be translated, but we would we would make all efforts we could to try to figure out what language it is and see if we can uh, get back to that person. Uh, perhaps you know maybe one of their relatives that uh, speaks English could 
could act as an intermediary too. That that would be helpful. Thank you for sharing, Jeff. And um, yeah, yeah, Ellie, if you have any recommendations, feel free to to share. Um, if you think that there's any, you know, solutions um, or ways to address these barriers, um, you know, I think I think others that have spoken would welcome that feedback and email if that's more comfortable for you. Um, as well, you know, folks have feedback for you know how these programs could work better for them. That's both something you know. I would love to support you in getting that feedback to the the right people. Um, and uh, want to thank you all again. I see it in the chat. Thank you, Ellie, for for that question. Thank you, all of the speakers, for your thoughtful responses and for all the information you've provided. I did see Janae. Um, again, I want to give this opportunity for any last words um, and wish everyone a lovely evening. Yeah, I just wanted to let you know, I put a link for the farmers.gov translation site. It does, uh, if you go to that, it does talk about the languages that are translated. And uh, basically it says we do have uh, translation services. So if you can take in like a piece of paper or something that has the language that you speak, you could like show it to them and they could get a translator for you is my understanding. Like. Um, if, if we can just figure out how to know what language. And the other thing I just wanted to remind everybody, don't be afraid to ask questions. Uh, when, you, when you get there, you know, you, you've got all this information going. When you get home, don't be afraid to call back and ask those follow-up questions because there is no stupid question. I love that. There is no stupid question. Would others like to share anything? I'll just come on and say, and I'll say thanks for the invite. And uh, I appreciate it again. Um, this is, I would consider part of the RMA Roadshow. It is a vision set out by the RMA administrator, uh, Marsha Bunger. Uh, and we made that happen for her. And this is one of, I think this is our last one. My Michigan trip just got canceled today because of the ice storm up there. But um, this may be the very last part of the RMA Roadshow uh, for, for the 23 crop year, I guess, and, and whole farm and micro farm. But this is one of probably 15 or 20 that I've done uh, over the last three or four months. Um, and uh, it's just always a pleasure to to speak to the to the folks that really matter uh, and that are and are seeking the information, and especially for some of our new programs and things like that. And and we always here at RMA uh, uh, request feedback. Please, if you have something that could happen or, or you have a, an idea for the program that may make it better or anything like that, just reach out. Uh, we consider all and every request. They may not make them, we may not make them all happen, but we always, uh, we always look at them and we study them a little bit. So, uh, because, you know, without you, you guys, we wouldn't have jobs for sure. Uh, so, uh, you, you, you folks are, are the ones that we're here to help and serve. So I appreciate the invite and, and the ability to, to, to present uh, the stuff that we did today. Thank you. Thank you, Lane. Thank you, Janae. Thank you, Taryn, Aaron. And thank you to our interpreter, Olga, who makes it possible for us to provide this information in Spanish. Um, and thank you all for your thoughtful questions and input. Uh, we really appreciate it. 
I hope to hear from each of you and get the opportunity to continue working with you all. Um, I wish you all a very good night. Take care of yourselves. You too, Anna. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye, Anna. Thank you. Thanks Bye. so much. Bye.